Okay, hi everyone. Welcome and thank you for participating in this live conversation with Aaron Panofsky and Ostagi Obasagi talking about behavioral genetics and uh, Aaron's book, Misbehaving Science. We're all really looking forward to this conversation. A um, few housekeeping things before we begin. I'm Marcy Darnofsky, the Executive Director here at the Center for Genetics and Society. And we wanted to let you know that this uh, conversation is being recorded because we make these events available on our uh, CGS Talking Biopolitics YouTube channel. And um, so uh, just want you to know that we are recording it. I um, also want to point out that you have some uh, things on your screen you should be aware of. Um, you'll be seeing Aaron and Osagi in just a minute, where you're seeing me now. And below that, you see a question and answer box. And you can submit your questions or your comments at any time during this conversation. What we're going to do and how we're going to schedule things today is that um, first I'm going to introduce Aaron and Osagi, and they'll talk with each other for about half an hour or 35 minutes or so. And then we're going to leave plenty of time to bring your thoughts, your questions, your comments into the conversation. And we ask you to submit them using that Q&A box on the bottom right of the screen there. Uh, let's see. We also want to let you know that we have a Twitter feed with the hashtag Talking Biopolitics and that Jessica Cousins is going to be tweeting um, live and uh, typically other people join in on that Twitter feed as well. And um, let's see, we'll be showing you a couple of slides during this introduction and a little bit later on too. The links that you'll see on um, everything on your screen are actually live links, but we're going to be sending you all the information that we show on the screen in a follow-up email, including all the links to additional resources and things like that. So, okay, so let's see. We wanted to let you know about the past Talking Biopolitics conversations, and we're going to get those up here. Um, we, at this point, have a really uh, wonderful trove of amazing conversations with all the people that you see there on your screen. And again, these are available on the CGS Talking Biopolitics YouTube channel. Um, on the, and, the, and as you'll see, if, if you know any of the folks in the books that, and the films that you see on the screen, it's a, it's a range of issues having to do with um, the social implications of human genetic and assisted reproductive technology. Okay, so we also wanted to let you know a little bit about CGS for those of you who are new. Uh, who are new. Um, Center for Genetics and Society is a public affairs organization working for responsible uses and effective governance of, of the whole range of human genetics and reproductive technologies. And uh, we've begun saying that we're trying to reclaim human biotechnology for the public good and in the public interest. We work, uh, our work is uh, very firmly in a grounding of the values that you see there, social justice, human rights, ecological integrity, the common good, and democratic governance. And um, we feel that that's the kind of perspective that's needed in approaching these issues. And what we do, um, how we actually do this, uh, we have a range of activities and programs. We work to build um, connections between uh, scholars across a range of disciplines and advocates across a range of civil society sectors who share our concerns and our values. So we work to build a biopolitical network. We also have a, our, what we call a strategic communications program. We work through the media to bring these perspectives. We have a full suite of online resources available, um, website, blog, social media, and newsletter and the like, and I encourage you to join in on those. Um, we do intervene in policy uh, situations at the uh, state, national, and even international level. And we do some advocacy-oriented research to further the goals that I've just mentioned. So th that's a word about the Center for Genetics and Society. And um, with that, I think it's time to turn to our conversation, today's conversation. So Aaron and Osagi, can you please start sharing your webcam? Great, here comes Asagi, and here comes Aaron. Welcome, both of you. Thank All you right. so much. 
for being here. Let me introduce you and then I will turn it over to you. So Aaron Panofsky is Associate Professor in Public Policy and at the Institute for Society and Genetics. So there's a clue that we might share some uh, concerns. And that's at the University of California, Los Angeles. Before joining at uh, UCLA, which was back in the beginning of 2008, Aaron was a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Scholar at UC Berkeley and he received his PhD in sociology from New York University. Aaron's main research interest is the sociology of science and knowledge, and his special focus is genetics. His book is Misbehaving Science, Controversy, and the Development of Behavior Genetics, and that's the focus of our conversation today. That's his first book. And as he'll be telling you much more about, it's an analysis of the causes and consequences of controversies in the field and about the field of behavioral genetics. And Aaron is also working on a project investigating how patient advocate groups seek to affect the research process in the medical genetics of rare disorders. Um, these and other projects fit with his interest in the governance of science and technology and the relationship between expertise and democracy. And those are definitely concerns we share here at the Center for Genetics and Society. So welcome, Aaron. Um, Osagi, Thank you. Obasagi is Professor of Law at UC, UC Hastings, and he has a joint appointment with the UC San Francisco Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And I'm very pleased to say he's also a senior fellow at the Center for Genetics and Society. In fact, he's been associated with CGS in several capacities since 2005. Obasagi's research attempts to bridge the conceptual and methodological gap between empirical and doctrinal scholarship on race. And a wonderful example of this is Osagi's first book, Blinded by Sight, Seeing Race Through the Eyes of the Blind, which was released last year and has received a lot of attention and some prizes. The scholarship also looks at the past and present roles of science in both constructing racial meanings and in explaining racial disparities. And this is tied to his interest in bioethics and particularly the social, ethical, and legal implications of human genetics and reproductive technologies. And uh, Osagi is also working on a second book. It's an anthology to be published by UC Press. The working title is Beyond Bioethics, Ford in New Biopolitics. And I have the privilege of co-editing that anthology with him. So thank you, Osagi. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you with just with a reminder that uh, to everyone who's joined us that you can submit your questions and your comments at any time in that Q&A box you see at the bottom right of your screen. Okay, so over to you, Osagi and Aaron. Great, thanks, Marcy. Uh, so Aaron, it's great for you to join us for this today. Um, so first, let me say I really, really enjoy your book. Uh, I think it's a fascinating um, exploration into the, the field of behavioral genetics, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so let's start with, with the book's title, Misbehaving Science. So what are you trying to capture with this title, and how does it relate to your understanding of behavioral genetics? Yeah, so I mean, Perhaps the first thing to contrast, and this is something that people often miss uh, or sometimes misunderstand about my intentions here, is I'm talking about misbehaving science. So science, a field of science that sort of uh, doesn't act the, the way we expect it to act. I'm not talking about misbehaving scientists, mm -hmm. right? So I'm, I'm very explicitly um, you know, not trying to question the motivations of the scientists or accuse anyone of, of, of fraud. This book is not about scientific fraud or malfeasance. It's about how a normal, a sensibly kind of normal scientific field um, ends up with certain dynamics that, um, that we don't expect from a scientific field. And in particular, um, what, is, what is sort of misbehaving about um, behavioral genetics is the fact that it has been subject to um, intense controversy for its entire 50-year existence, right? Um, and so that's interesting from a scientific point of view, right? So at least in the way we sort of normally think about science is you have controversies, moments when scientists sort of disagree about something, um, and then they do experiments, they hash things out, and then one way or another, uh, the controversy sort of gets resolved. Now, I mean, there are a lot of theories about that. Is, is it because of sort of Kuhn thought the, a new paradigm emerges and the old paradigm withers away because, you know, the, the old guys who, who believe it die off or whatever? 
Um, or is it because we have some conjecture and refutation and you know, new, new truth comes about? But in behavioral genetics, what's really distinctive is that, um, that, that the fundamental premises about how we study behavior um, and, and the inheritance of behavior, those sort of biological connections of behavior, are disputed from the you know, 30s and 40s in the prehistory of the field um, up through the 50s, when the field 50s and 60s, when the field gets founded, and then all the way to the present moment, and right, and so that the the sort of the field is never able to sort of process the disputes about how we understand behavior and genetics um, in in a, a way that that can resolve and put some of these controversies behind it. So that's what I'm really referring to, is about how. Um, we cannot come to a you know a collective scientific agreement about the proper relationship between genetics and behavior, and it's and and my argument is that it's connected to the structure, the, the sociological structure, the organizational and cultural structure of the field. Mm -hmm. It's not just connected to we have a politicized society that can't agree how to handle people or uh, their politics of knowledge. Those things are related, but but what I fundamentally argue is that it's about the scientific field itself, and it's uh, sort of um, basically it's disorganization. Great, great. And I think that's a that's a really interesting and important distinction that you're making between having a critique of the field versus of any particular individual. I think that's a really interesting way of approaching this this issue. Um, and so, how did you become interested in this topic? So you know, it, it kind of goes way back. I mean, so so um, so. I started out college as being interested in biology, um, being interested in science, and uh, you know this is a this is a, a not very often uh, talked about uh, benefit of liberal education. But um, through that process, especially with the interaction with uh, uh, one or two professors who had a very kind of biological determinist and uh, and sort of evolutionary reductionist way of thinking about humanity and human character and human behavior. I really found out that that's not what I wanted to do, right? So it was so. So one of the functions of liberal education is finding out what you uh, disagree with and trying to figure out how you disagree with it. So that was the first thing. I mean, that that doesn't characterize all bi bi biologists, but but the particular ones that I interacted with, and so it sort of turned me towards thinking more critically about science, thinking uh, more sociologically about science, and then I went to graduate school. Um, at NYU, and I was very blessed with some really amazing teachers. Um, one of whom that I uh, came to NYU because of was um, Dorothy Nelkin, who, um, you know, one of the most sort of famous uh, students of science and technology, and she wrote an incredibly famous book called the, uh, with with uh, Susan Lindy called the DNA Mystique, mm -hmm. right? Which was in a way a sort of cultural critique of the way that gene language and and gene talk about behavior and about human differences um, has infused um, popular culture and, and come to inform the way scientists talk publicly about genetics and behavior and all these things. And um, so, so I was in some ways attract, always concerned with this question about uh, biological determinism and, and where it comes from, how, how we think about it, its implications for society. and. Um, and as I started to kick around the idea of a, of a project on behavioral genetics, I realized that there were really sort of two dominant approaches to that. One was um, Dot Nelkin's way of doing it, which was let's look at the implications, let's look at the language and the discourse and how the scientific field um, kind of uh, influences the society and the way that the public thinks about these things. Um, and then there was another approach, which was say let's look very technically at the at the you know, how are the statistics run? How, how are um, uh, twins gathered? What are the fundamental assumptions of an adoption study? How are they defining behavior? When, when they generate a heritability estimate, what does that mean and what can you logically in, and not infer? And, and so then there's a huge approach to behavioral genetics, which is being very critical of um, those sort of technical aspects, technical and conceptual aspects. And I wanted to try to kind of find a third way, right? Because I felt like both of those were really well established ways of thinking about the field. But part of what was interesting to me about the field was how polarized the conversation about it was, right? Is there a way for me to kind of cut, I don't know, or, or drive, drive something between the furrows, right? It's not really cutting the Gordian knot, but it's like finding a, a, a different way across, across the, the, the furrows of this debate. 
Um, and I started to realize that no one had really looked sociologically at the field itself, right? So people had had, um, ha had, had taken pot shots at the field, right? They said, oh, there's a whole bunch of racists in this field, or there's a whole bunch of conservatives in this field, or there's a whole bunch of the wrong kind of scientists in that field. And that's what accounts for these disagreements or, or this determinist way of thinking about behavior. Um, and, but I wanted to really get at um, what is it about the field and how it's organized that, that might contribute to this polarization about, of perspectives on, on behavior. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of where the origins of my sort of sociological approach to look at the field as a field. Okay. Cool. Great. Um, so one thing I really enjoy about your book is that it lays out this amazing dynamic within the field of behavioral gen genetics. So on the one hand, those who found the field are really sensitive to kind of the political and social missteps of previous attempts to talk about uh, right. you know, the heritability of traits and, and behavior. And then on, on the other hand, you know, this sensitivity kind of waned over time. And the field didn't really or didn't exactly reject those individuals that eventually went back and started to re-engage these conversations about, you know, the heritability of, of group difference um, and, and um, how that difference is spread across uh, or how that difference is distributed differently over various groups or between various groups. And can you talk more about this, this dynamic? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. So, I mean, this is the sort of beginning of the historical narrative that I, that I track in the book. And, you know, I'll try to go into it just a little bit and not take up all our time because I, I could go on forever. But, you know, where the field is really founded in the 50s and 60s is by an interdisciplinary group of scientists who are really trying to relaunch the study of behavior and, and biology and genetics. Right? And they're trying to relaunch it from the discrediting it had in the earlier era of eugenics, right? This is a post-war period um, where people realize that, like, you know, eugenics and scientific racism are bad, right? They don't, they don't want, they, do, they want to see if, can we study this without going there, without um, it being taken over by the idea of eugenics, by the idea of scientific racism and the comparison of, you know, different group capacities. And so um, in, in that period, they really, quite literally tried to write that stuff out of the field, right? This is our field, it's not this, it's this, it's not this. These are the people that are going to be involved, not those old guys that, you know, were doing stuff that we didn't like. And, and, they, and by about 1970, or just before 1970, they had really tried to establish the field in a very sort of integrated way, right? It's, we're, on the one hand, we're going to keep those questions off the table, but on the other hand, we want to keep questions like the heritability of, you know, IQ and so forth. We're not going to reject that completely. But we want it to be like one component in a long list of ways of approaching behavior that are going to integrate evolution and anthropology and sociology and so, you know social inheritance and, and genetic inheritance and, and comparing animals and humans and, and looking at the rigor of animal studies and can we bring that to human studies, all that stuff. Um, but what happens in 1969 is, uh, or what happens is that in 1969, Arthur Jensen uh, a very sort of infamous figure in this field um, uh, wrote uh, an important essay called um, uh, How Much Can We Boost IQ um, and Education? Gosh, I'm getting the title a little bit wrong, but it's how, basically how much can we boost IQ and achievement? And his argument, that's the title, he drew from behavior genetics in all sorts of different ways, including animal studies, right? He has these graphs of like mice responses to, 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 to uh, maze running behavior. And, um, and he basically argued, look, but the field of behavioral genetics proves that, uh, genetic, that, that, that intelligence is genetically determined and that the group, uh, that the black-white achievement gap, right, I'm, I'm drawing bell curves here, uh, the space between the bell curves, between the white bell curve and the um, black bell curve in IQ is probably genetic, has a, a large genetic component, and that tells us that um, Head Start, that uh, that, that compensatory social programs of the great society are doomed to failure and we should not be spending our, our money there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that kicked off the sort of first great controversy in the field um, and set the, 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 the trajectory of the field forever after, right? So it's a, li a little bit complicated to, to, uh, to describe in all detail here and I really would love to invite people to that. <laughs> it was a great pitch to invite people to read the book, but, but basically what, what happens here is that the, um, although the behavior geneticists get split, some of them want to throw Jensen out of the field and say, hey, no, no, we already got rid of this stuff. Other ones um, 
are start responding to the general um, critique that that Jensen brings into the field, right? So so radicals, uh, social scientists, psychologists, uh, student groups, um, radical biologists, all start criticizing the research, start criticizing Jensen's ideas. But for the most part, they don't stop with Jensen. They don't say, well, excise this tumor from the field and then go on with your good, good behavior genetics. They blame behavior genetics for Jensen and don't allow any distinction between the two. And they really pursue this kind of um, scorched earth approach to criticizing behavior genetics. And many of the mainstream behavior geneticists in response to that realize, well, even if we try to throw Jensen out of the field, they are still going to, so many critics don't even accept the premise that, that you can even talk about genetics and behavior. And so they really felt that the, their only play, their only move was to uh, kind of have an arm's length embrace of Jensen. Not, oh, he's really at the heart of our field, but, you know, we defend him and we defend his right to do research and a lot of what he says is true. And um, and so, so they end up basically embracing um, Jensen into the field. And what ends up happening is the field at that point fractures. Many of the people who all these interdisciplinary perspectives that were interested in behavior genetics start uh, leaving the field saying, this is too hot for me. Mm -hmm. It turns out that this field really is about the genetic determination of IQ. That's not what I signed up for. I'm out of here. Um, uh, I don't want to take heat from the Richard Lawanson and, and Leon Kamen and, and, and Stephen Jay Gould of the world. And so, so the field kind of ends up consolidating, despite its original intentions, around a kind of vision that Jensen articulated for the field. And they spend a lot of the next um, 10 to 15 years defending, um, if not Jensen directly, the, the questions that were raised by the critique of Jensen. And so those get embedded at the very center of the field. And so it's this funny thing where they start out really not wanting to go where the you know Jensen's of the world might take them, and then end up being completely consumed by the Jensen uh, way of thinking about uh, the behavior genetics relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, one thing, another interesting, indeed fascinating aspect of, of your book is, you know, how this this controversy during this period led the field to understand and interpret responsibility in particular ways. So, uh, on the one hand, it led for responsibility to be thought of and conceived of in terms of responsibility to science, namely through uh, individual scientific freedom, as opposed to a broader notion of social responsibility. Um, and furthermore, you know, attempts at deepening a conversation about social responsibility ultimately failed in the field. And I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, how this idea or understanding of responsibility played out uh, both during this period and going forward. Right. So, so during this period, um, you know, I think there there was a big debate, right? So one of the uh, a major figure at the time, and actually one of kind of the father figures of the field, was um, Dobzhansky. Right? So he's a, an, ama an important population geneticist who was um, a teacher of both some of the field's greatest critics, like Richard Lawanson, as well as some of the field's participants. And, and you know, he was sort of seen as a kind of father figure for the field. Um, and when Jensen and others started to um, make these claims about race and, and these hypotheses about genetic determination of intelligence, um, the Jonsky sort of uh, line on this was, look, um, scientific responsibility needs, or, or scientific freedom needs to be coupled with an understanding of scientific responsibility. And this needs to be like, the, why are we asking these questions? What are we trying to do here? We need to be very clear with the public what, what, what the truth of our field is. Um, but also that we need to sort of understand that uh, science has a responsibility to ask questions that are salutary to, to society. And so he had this kind of complicated notion of responsibility that he was trying to advocate for um, that was saying, look, you know, we need to um, basically, you know, we shouldn't cut off directions of research, but we should understand why people would be opposed to them and, that, and we should take that seriously mm -hmm. um, and respond to that and try to do research that will help people, right, that will lead to social betterment. Um, and what ended up happening was that uh, you have a sort of array in, during this controversy. Uh, well, basically, what happens during, during that, the, the Jensen controversy is 
that position gets kind of identified with politicizing science, mm -hmm. right? And it gets linked with people like um, Richard Lowenton, um, Stephen Jay Gould, Leon Kamen, and these guys had explicitly aligned themselves with the radical science movement and Marxism, right? So they uh, explicitly said, look, you know, my politics are Marxist, and that's part of what motivates my critique of this field, but I'm also a, a good scientist. And so basically, um, the critique of behavior genetics got aligned very closely with left-wing politics, right? And so then the way to oppose that wasn't, you know, oh, and, and the accuse, accusation that behavior genetics is really right-wing politics in sheep's clo clothing, right? But uh, what behavior genetics has said is, no, no, we're apolitical. And the way to be apolitical is to defend, is to not talk about scientific response, social responsibility. That's a political thing. Um, and, uh, and therefore, to depoliticize the field, they felt like the only political position or the only re position of responsibility they had was to defend scientific freedom, right? This is a n politically neutral uh, version of social responsibility. Now, of course, it's not politically neutral because what it ends up defending is people like, um, people like uh, Jensen that are, that are making these racial claims There's, and, and other folks that were making even more inflammatory claims. Claims than Jensen, um, but that, but but it was through this controversy that 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 version of responsibility became the dominant one. Mm -hmm. And so, as the field developed, um, behavior genetics opened up to a slightly wider version of responsibility, which is that we need to accurately communicate what our what our science says and doesn't say. But um, that is also complicated because no one agrees fundamentally what the science says. So when you say we're going to accurately communicate, well, but they're not communicating the controversy, they're communicating their version of it, and then that spawns that, that public conversation, which they, they see as essential to their responsibility, actually in, inflames more criticism and more disagreement because the, the fundaments haven't been agreed upon in the first place. Mm -hmm. So there's all these ironies in which the, their version of responsibility um, is, is, is you know, an apolitical one that actually spawns a certain kind of political response is, is a version of publicity that ends up causing as many problems as it, as it um, addresses. And so they really get stuck in this, in this way. Um, and, and, and I think the case of behavior genetics really illustrates some of the dilemmas and the problematic ways of, of, uh, that science gets stuck in, in, er, around thinking about responsibility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, what impact, if any, did the development of new molecular technologies have on behavioral genetics? Yeah, this is an interesting uh, question, and actually, Marcy asked me about this before, which was like, sort of, how how, how does the debate about uh, new um, the assisted reproductive technologies intersect mm -hmm. behavior genetics? Right, the the, the, the thing that hit, hit the news today about, or, or just in the last couple of weeks about the. Um, CRISPR method for 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 uh, changing the germline, mm -hmm. and so there's been two ways of of, of uh, thinking about that. On the one hand, um, you know, hey, look, there are no, it, there are no genes for IQ or intelligence, right? And this is one of the things the field has never found those genes that, that so many people have been looking for. I um, mean, so we don't really have to worry about it. But then Marcy was t t telling me, you know, but one thing that happens is it, it changes the conversation. About um, b about behavior when we talk about behavior in genetic terms. So maybe there is no gene that will be found that will you know allow us to create a designer baby, but it allows us to think about human life and uh, behavior and social differences in these terms. And um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the molecular um, direction of this field is that uh, that, that that it, it has actually opened many of the old school behavior geneticists who are actually psychologists at heart, right, trained as psychologists, not as geneticists. Some of them are geneticists, but that is, um, those guys are the sort of newcomers that came in with their, with the molecular technologies, right? The people from the 60s, 70s, 80s, or well, 70s, 80s, 90s were often um, psychologists. Um, the, the, the advent of molecular technologies, on the one hand, they've been interested to look for the genes for IQ and intelligence, but it has also kind of moderated their stance on, on the genetic determination of IQ and intelligence in some ways. So 
so they start to think more about, hey, our twin studies can, can tell us about the environment. They can tell us about interactions between um, social environments and genes. And, and, and it makes, uh, they start to represent themselves in a kind of more holistic way. Hey, we're the ones who care about the whole person. We're the ones who care about environment and context. Those geneticists, all they care about is molecules, right? We care about people. We care about social context. And that's ironic because in that earlier generation, the, the generation that Lawanson and Jensen and all those guys, were, were, where they were debating, the behavior geneticists saw, represented themselves as the real scientists, right? The psychologists and the sociologists, they are, um, they, they, they have these kind of, uh, um, how do I put it, um, these kind of airy-fairy ways of thinking about, um, about behavior. They're not rigorous scientists, culture, blah, 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 all this stuff we can't count. Biology is real. It's real science. And we're, we're going to reduce behavior down to real science and finally put the science of society and the science of behavior on scientific foundations. So in that earlier, they represented themselves really as the kind of determinants. But once the molecular geneticists start coming in, they flip their story and start to say, oh, well, actually, we're not the reductionists. They're the reductionists, and you know, we want to represent ourselves in a different way. And so there's all these ironies when you really pay close attention to how the field itself works that the positions that the, that the behavioral geneticists have taken shift quite a bit. Like there is no, I don't think, fundamental um, way that these, that, the, that these ideas have to be sold and packaged, right? They can be packaged in, in relatively flexible ways, um, even though I think Marcy's right to, um, to have the concern that they do tell us, they do potentially tell us some stories about human fixity that are, that are um, you know, that, that is consistent across the different stories. And so they, there are still things to be worried about on whether or not they're true. Right. And just to, you know, continue this conversation, you know, what, what lessons can we learn from this particular exploration into the field of behavioral genetics uh, going forward? So you talked a little bit about, um, you know, uh, assisted reproduction and, and some of the new gene, te gene editing technologies. I was, I was wondering if you have any other ideas about, you know, what your, what your research might tell us about, you know, how, do we, should, how we, we should think about various scientific fields um, as these technologies have a greater impact on our day-to-day -day lives. Right. So I guess there's uh, um, at least sort of two, um, two stories here. One is, um, one is the sort of story about behavioral genetics, right? And I think where, where, where I actually wanted to, thanks for following up on this, where I wanted to go with, with that previous question about um, assisted reproductive technology is that actually I think behavioral genetics is in this kind of liminal uh, period where it's not clear what the story about, about society is trying to tell it, right? So um, 20 years ago in the early 90s when people did, um, talked about, when behavior geneticists talked about the implications of their research for education, for example, they typically said stuff like, well, the environment doesn't matter very much. Mm -hmm. That once you get past like true deprivation, like kids living in utter abject poverty with neglectful and abusive parents and they don't have enough eat to eat and, you know, and, and they never show up in school, once you get past that, it doesn't really matter. Once you get into sort of average environments, it, it's not going to affect differences that much. So the implication was, let's not invest too much in schools, or let's not worry about that too much. I mean, people are basically going to be who they're going to be. Um, now, um, I was just at this uh, conference that was talking about what are the contemporary um, concerns with behavior genetics and, and intelligence and education. And um, I read a book uh, in preparation by um, Robert Plowman, who's sort of the undisputed leader of one of the most important behavioral geneticists around. He's, he's done a ton of work on the genetics of intelligence. And he's spent uh, the last, you know, 15 years of his career looking for genes for IQ. And um, he wrote this book uh, with, with uh, Catherine Ashbury called uh, G is for Genes. And, um, and it's basically what would a genetically informed educational system look like? And so what's really interesting is they make a very opposite claim to what behavior geneticists were talking about 20 years ago, even though they're using a lot of the same data. I mean, the, a lot of the, 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 the genes for IQ, you know, have not been discovered. They, they're hopeful that they're going to be discovered, but they're not basing it on those ideas. They're basing it on, you know, further research in the same tradition that 
people were talking about 20 years ago. But the conclusion they draw is very different. They say what schools need, we need to invest much more in schools. We need to invest in giving children choices. We need to give children personalized educational plans. We need to uh, cultivate the individuality of every child through massive public investments in, in education, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, they have a, a, an image of what a genetically informed school would look like. And what I found really interesting was that the vision that they talk about looked to me like um, what uh, Dewey and other progressive educationists talked about 100 years ago. Uh, the cultivation of the child, putting the child in front of the curric before the curriculum, um, letting the child sort of discover their own way through through an array of of, of, of choices, linking um, child children's options to the kinds of uh, trajectories they might take in society, all this stuff. Um, I mean, still important differences, but but what was ironic about it was, you know, Robert Plowman would very much fall in the line line of the tradition of Stephen Pinker, who wrote. Um, the book, The Blank Slate, which ridicules the social scientists and psychologists for ignoring genes and treating children as blank slates. Well, who's in that tradition? Dewey. But it turns out that <laughs> there's kind of a convergence where, where uh, Plowman's sort of vision of education ends up looking not utterly dissimilar from, from Dewey's vision. And so in some ways, I feel like there's an opening up point where on the one hand, behavior geneticists, you know, so Pullman also works with um, Beijing uh, Genomics Institute to look for those IQ genes in genius children, right? And he really wants to find those genes, and BGI wants to then implant them in, well, they maybe want to implant them in embryos and make super babies. Um, I don't know if Pullman wants to do that, but he wants to find those genes. So he wants to do that. But he also sees genetically informed education as not about human limits and human fixity and society is good enough to disinvest, retrench, um, but let's invest more. So, so there's kind of, I think it's a period where the discourse around behavior genetics is opening up and it's actually a little bit unclear where it's going. And I think the future developments of the field around these controversies are liable to have a big impact on that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then let me just quickly say, and I think that the other lesson from the story, from this um, thing about, from this book about science, not necessarily about behavioral genetics generally, mm -hmm. is that um, that uh, so, so so I have uh, the, my favorite line in the book is on the very last page I think, which I should probably have had it much earlier, but it's 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 something like this that um, that I say that knowledge that science freed from structure puts knowledge in shackles. And so what the point of the book is that when a field is socially disorganized and there are limited rules by which scientists agree about how they interact, about the norms of communication, about the norms of responsibility, about the norms of scientific communi uh, communication, mutual critique, um, what the boundaries of the field are, what the hierarchies are, when all that stuff is unsettled, as it is in behavior genetics, I believe, that doesn't free knowledge to be to go wherever it wants to go. It actually means that knowledge gets stuck in very thin furrows. And that's really what the sort of um, conceptual sociology of knowledge contribution of this book is, is that a destructuring of the social organization of science leads to na a narrowing of, of intellectual possibility. And so the lesson then would be that we should be worried as, from a sort of science policy point of view about all these um, trends in contemporary science to destructure science. So this could go all the way from the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health um, being so gung-ho on interdisciplinary science, right? We need to combine uh, research communities, but we're not building the sort of social structures that sustain those communities necessarily. Or um, that we don't care that scientists have all these hybrid roles as entrepreneurs, scientists, uh, connected to uh, pharmaceutical companies, um, also in the clinic, also uh, in the public and writing uh, you know, op-ed, that, that scientists have so many audiences that they don't have that kind of more traditional focus, inward focus on a, on a uh, 
core set of experts that they're that, that they're really focused on in, in pressing, right? So that so so that the scientists can be like, well, get, it's gotten too hot in here. You know, this controversy is is too complicated, so I can leave and go do my other fill one of my other roles. Um, and so a field that doesn't kind of centripetally um, magnify and focus scientists' sort of professional identities on on each other. Um, I worry that it, it, it can lead to this kind of destructuring of science that might lead to intellectual narrowing. So that's you know that's a um, that's sort of a hypothesis that I observe that, that about other fields that I observe in this field. Okay, great, great. So we're going to pause for just a minute or so, and um, just before we bring in a question and comments from the audience, um, and I believe Marcy had a few words for us. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Asagi and Aaron. That was fascinating. And I just, the way that you bring together all these threads, Aaron, and connect all these dots, I think that's so much to offer for the very confusing and um, consequential moment that we find ourselves in now. What I wanted to, um, to uh, tell you all, uh, all who are on the phone joining us for this, is first of all, that we would, at this point, really welcome your comments, your thoughts, your questions. And you can type those into that box at the bottom right of your screen. And then in just a moment, we'll go back to um, Aaron and Osagi, and they can take on some of your questions. Um, I also wanted to let you know about more ways you can stay involved with the Center for Genetics and Society. And as you see on the screen there, um, we would welcome your monetary contributions. And we would also welcome your involvement um, in the ways that we show there. We have a, a newsletter that comes out every other week that compiles the commentary that CGS staff, fellows, and colleagues, um, the writings that we do on our blog. And we have um, a really wonderful social media um, presence now that Jessica Cousins is largely responsible for. And so you can follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Google+. And we have a vast array of resources on our website. Um, so uh, any uh, archival research even at this point you want to do or uh, browsing for the current news and commentary on a whole range of human genetic and assisted reproductive um, issues. I, I really do feel like our website is a great resource. And we also wanted to point uh, out to you that there are a lot of things you can do to learn more about Aaron and about his book and really encourage you to read the book. I think you can hear how um, fascinating it is and how important for the moment that we're in. And um, Osagi's book is also shown there. It's a really interesting, fascinating book in its own right. And we did have a talking bio, we should have a talking bio yeah, Maybe about, we can switch roles. That. I'd love to uh, interview Osagi about it. Oh, there's an idea. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Um, so we'll be sending you again, as I said, all this information in a follow-up email. And um, we also, at the end of this session, when we come up on the hour, we have we have more to come, so please stay with us. But at the end of the session, we'll be asking just a few questions. You'll get um, your uh, when we log off, you'll get redirected to uh, a few questions with uh, an opportunity to tell us about how you thought about this event and what ideas you might have about future talking bio talking biopolitics events. So. Um, Thanks for the questions that are coming in. Please send more thoughts and questions using that Q&A box. And I'm going to turn it back to Osagi and Aaron now. Great. OK, so we have a, a couple questions coming through now. Um, so first one for Aaron. So in terms of your new book, can you deconstruct the controversy over the quote unquote God gene when it first came out in the popular media? Is it still yeah. discussed in your circles? Yeah, so I think that this is actually a really instructive uh, story. So, um, so the where the, that that research sort of uh, uh, um, originated from uh, was the, uh, a researcher named Dean Hamer, right? And so Dean Hamer had actually uh, gotten notoriety a, a few. So, so it, what, what Dean Hamer um, purported to find was uh, he wrote a book called I think called The God Gene. And he basically purported to find some um, genetic variant that was associated 
with uh, individuals responding um, high on a survey question for like kind of religiosity or, 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 or inclination to, towards religious experience, right? And so he wrote this kind of whole book about this one ultimately uh, pr 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 pretty um, poorly uh, confirmed um, uh, genetic association, right? And, I, and so, and so the one, one answer to that question is like, no, people have not, as far as I know, I mean, I'm not, I, I personally haven't followed it, but I'm pretty sure that it has not been followed up very carefully mm -hmm. um, by other researchers. It was kind of a flash in the pan idea that kind of um, has withered on the vine. But here's why it's instructive, right? So um, the, the man who did this, Dean Hamer, um, this was his second uh, um, foray into behavioral genetics. His first foray into behavioral genetics was with the discovery of the so-called gay gene um, in the early 90s. Right, and so Dean Hamer, so, so the, the, the gay gene study was, was really interesting and, and, and very informative. Um, Dean Hamer wrote a, a memoir about that research project. And in that project, in the memoir in the beginning, he said, well, why did I go into this research called, about the gay gene? Um, it turned out that uh, Dean Hamer was a molecular geneticist. He worked at uh, the National Institutes of Health. He was an intramural researcher, so he was employed by NIH. Um, and he worked on these, this sort of cancer, uh, cancer, this model of a, a particular biological process in, in cancer genetics. Um, and in this, in this memoir, he talks about, well, you know, this, this whole area of cancer genetics was really not very, um, it, it seemed like so academic. It seemed so abstract and ivory tower. I couldn't communicate it to other people. I really wanted to study something that made people tick. And so, he basically describes, I don't want to put too many words in his mouth, but, he, but you could sort of interpret his, his foray into behavior genetics as um, a kind of scientific midlife crisis, right? So he's going along, he's built this sort of established career, but he's, he's starting to get bored by it. And he says, okay, well, how can I make a splash? I mean, quite sort of literally says that stuff. And he says, ah, let's talk about sexuality, um, human behavior. This is the most important, you know, this is the thing that everyone will be interested in. And so then he goes and does this study, gets a huge amount of uh, media attention, uh, writes a, a popular book that's on a trade press, um, you know, does the circuit of media attention. He, he sort of complains that no one understood it, understood it, and they accused him of all these things that he wasn't responsible for. But, but part of the story is that what, one of the things that makes behavior genetics attractive to scientists, why they come to the field, is not because they're interested in some detailed uh, microdynamics of some molecular genetic process. They're interested in what makes people tick, and more explicitly, they're interested in making a splash. They're interested in a way that this is, is research that will instantly garner public attention. Now, they may not sort of self-consciously think they're interested in that, I mean, but Hamer is pretty explicit about it. Um, and, and I think that that's very, very instructive because part of what's going on in this field and why it's attractive and also so sort of chaotic is there are not very many um, social controls on people sort of jumping into the field and trying to make a big splash. And as we said before, the sense of responsibility is, is kind of a, hey, we don't, we don't police each other. We don't tell people what's legit and illegit research in this domain. So you can kind of go in there. It's kind of wild westy. You can kind of go in there and do whatever you want. And so. So the, the God gene, I think, was in some ways a way of keeping that cycle of, of attention and hype going. And Hamer's continue, ongoing research has barely followed up on this, and very few people have followed up on uh, a little bit on the gay gene stuff, but relatively little. And I think, as far as I know, almost nothing on the God gene. Um, but, but what it does illustrate is one of the important things that this field does is give people symbolic resources, scientists, symbolic resources for gaining public attention, gaining notoriety, um, and, um, and making a splash uh, both with other scientists and with the public, with the media, and things like that. Okay. Great. And the, the next question we have is, and this might be related to the previous question, but um, why do we keep hearing about dubious genetic influences, the so-called gene of the week phenomenon? Uh, is this connected to wanting to make a splash, or are there that are deeper uh, reasons uh, or explanations for this? So, so I think part of it is that sort of wanting to make a splash thing, right? That, that, um, that most of the kind of gene of the week phenomenon that a lot of people have talked about are, are behavioral traits. Uh, uh, there was kind of an interesting article 
um, once written by um, a sociologist named Peter Conrad called, and this was, you know, 15 years ago at this point, but has the gene for alcoholism really been discovered three times? And it was sort of the, the, the short attention span of the news cycle combined with the sort of uncritical good news frame in which uh, genetics research is often um, taken up, right? It's something that you can talk about without talking about, um, you know, crazy politics and social costs, right? You can sort of just talk about it as this really interesting little nugget. Um, and, but then that, that, that there was sort of this unawareness of the previous three times or four times that, 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 that it had been, you know, discovered. And so I think that a lot of that is this kind of, um, this way in which um, respect, and, respect is built in the field is by um, making, um, making a large splash. And a lot of that Gene of the Week stuff um, was connected to um, the molecular genetics moment after the, you know, the Human Genome Project started going. But it actually, in a lot of ways, was before that, right? So behavior geneticists have off, have long relied on public interest in their research as a way of sort of driving it forward, right? So the, 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 there's a long tradition of the twin study folks talking about the really magical and amazing connections between twins, like twins separated at birth that sneeze the same way and eat the same foods and all this other stuff. And that being an important way, telling those stories in public as being an important way of valorizing the field. Um, and talking about, you know, we may be controversial among the scientists and the psychologists and the sociologists and the geneticists may criticize us. But the people know, you know, anyone who's had a second child knows that genes matter. Anyone who is who, who, you know, who looks at these twins would know that we are talking about something really important. And so trying to gather that public credibility as a way when they're um, facing all sorts of criticism from other scientists as a kind of resource to build the field mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and do maybe kind of an end run around the criticism, criticisms they were receiving. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Aaron, what surprised you as you researched this book? Did anything kind of jump out out of you that you didn't expect? So, I think the thing that one of the things that surprised me and actually took me a long time to deal with was the utter amount of disagreement about very basic things, like about statistics, right? Like that that something like a heritability estimate, like a percent, you know, that IQ is sixty or seventy percent heritable. That phrase, people will agree with that statement, but utterly disagree about what it means, what the significance of heritability is. And all. So, so I think what the biggest puzzle for me was the one that ultimately ended up becoming the sort of topic of the field, but it took me a long time to figure out how to deal with it, was how can you have a field where the basic statistics that people deal with, no one agrees what it means, right? I mean, in a way that people, I don't know, I, I found that very surprising that you could have a field that worked and produced papers and, and careers and all these things when no one could agree about upon the most important element at the center of the, of the field. That was surprising to me. Another surprising thing to me was um, learning that, uh, that it, it was really um, clin you know, clinical psychologists, not necessarily lab psychologists who were poisoning rats or whatever, making them run around. But, but clinical psychologists who are, who are studying people with paper and pencil um, personality tests, IQ tests and things like that, were really at the heart of the field, right? So we talk about behavior genetics. You sort of assume that it's geneticists, that it's biologists, that it's, that it's those types, evolutionists that are doing this. Um, but that they, for much of the field's history, those are not the people who have been driving the field. Another thing that's interesting is that I felt like actually some of the ways that critics have represented the field have been um, off base. And so, for example, critics have represented the field as, um, say, behavioral genetics and evolutionary psychology and sociobiology um, as all the same thing, right? This is part of a determinist way of thinking about human life, and these, this, is, this is a field. And, um, but when you start to actually talk to the behavior geneticists and people like that, they all see those things as very different, right? So that, well, you know, the behavior geneticists say, no, we're interested in human individual differences, individuality. 
evolutionists are interested in species typical behavior or maybe you know sexual selection dynamics that make men and women or males and females different and they don't see that as at all aligned with their own um, research project and so part of what I another one of the findings of my research that was surprising to me was that tracing the history of that difference right that I think in the 50s and 60s people wanted you know, before sociobio before E.O. Wilson wrote sociobiology, before Jensen had come along, they thought that all those kinds of ways of thinking about behavior would be one field and would inform each other. But because of the controversies that have happened and the way that the intellectual structure of the field fragmented into all these different little pieces, um, things like sociobiology are seen as, you know, that's not us, you know, no way. Uh, and, and, and vice versa, the evolutionary psychologists say, you know, we're not interested in that behavior genetic stuff. Plus, we're really not interested in that race stuff. And, and so, so, um, so that was another interesting thing to me, or surprising thing, which is the way that people had understood the field before had some, I think, historical inaccuracies for political reasons. Right, right. And uh, as a last question, uh, what's the next project? So, what are you working on now? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I I wish I had a really great awesome answer for you, but but I think what I'm interested in pursuing is that is that question that you kind of opened with, which is what, what what are the lessons that we can derive from behavioral genetics about things like uh, scientific responsibility? Um, I, I'm interested in in pursuing um, ways that different, maybe comparing different fields of science and how they have responded to. Um, public controversies and um, what are the conditions for different versions of kind of responsibility to emerge and then maybe trying to trace those back to um, to, uh, to to some of the structural things about the field. I mean so I was very interested in the um, like one one example of this would be uh, the geneticist response to the Nicholas Wade book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, What's the a troublesome inheritance? That's what it's called, right? Um, and so it started out seeming like that this was going to be they were going to respond to this book the same way that they responded to the bell curve, which is to try to say, oh, you know, that's not us. Uh, we're going to ignore it. Um, we're not going to respond publicly, um, or or that it would be left to a, a small cadre of sort of activists to 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 really take it down but that the genetics community would remain silent, which is basically what happened when the bell curve came out in 1994. We didn't really talk about that, but that's another major controversy that was set up by the Jensen stuff. Uh, but, you know, what ended up happening, and, you know, I don't think the, I don't think it's quite over yet, right, but what ended up happening was that the, a, a group of something like 140 population geneticists um, came out and said, you know, a very brief statement, but basically said, look, Nicholas Wade does not represent us. There's no support in our field for what he said about race and about um, human history, um, which was, you know, different. Why did that happen? You know, um, why? And, and so how did the field change and decide that, you know, being a little bit political, right? They don't say anything dramatic. They don't say, you know, so vote for Obama or something. Nothing political in those terms. But by saying, by taking a stand about a publicly contentious issue, um, they changed the conversation about that issue very dramatically. And I think the air was really let out of uh, uh, Wade's tires in a lot of ways, um, in a way that the bell curve was not reputed by, by them. And they actually really, um, I mean, there's a story I tell a little bit in the book about how, how they really resisted, the genetics community really resisted um, taking that on, uh, I think for a variety of reasons. So I'm interested. So that would might be one example of a thing I would talk about. Well, so what are the conditions under which different versions of scientific responsibility emerge, and how are they linked to uh, to the politics of science, to um, structural conditions of science? Like that. That's great. I'm looking forward to reading your work on that. So um, we're we're looking forward to writing. It. <laughs> so we're at the hour, and unfortunately, we have to wrap things up. So, Aaron, I want to thank you again for, for joining us, and I believe Marcy has a few final words for us. Yeah, thank you so much for talking, yeah, Marcy. Yeah, so much. Thank, thank you so much. That was great, and I look forward to the future work and the future conversations. Um, I also want to take this minute to thank 
um, Charles Garzon and Jessica Kessler for a lot of behind the scenes support, technical, uh, tweeting, emails. And I also, of course, want to thank all of you for participating in this and joining us. And you'll be hearing from us, as I said, with uh, all the links that you saw on the screen. And we'd like to hear from you. And uh, if you have a minute to fill out that short survey that you'll see, that would be great. So thanks for ev to everyone. And join us for the next Talking Biopolitics that you'll be hearing from us about.